Amy, can you hear me okay? I can. Excellent. I'm going to let you do your own little intro. That's yeah. fine. Okay. Awesome. You just let me know when y'all are ready. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. So excited. We've been looking so forward to having Sydney Olson come talk to us. We've done a lot of prep for this uh, presentation, talking to them about you know our expectations, questions, things we were wondering about, and so all, all of this has informed Sydney's uh, talk for today. And because I always find it awkward to do an introduction for a speaker, I'm just going to hand it over to Sydney and uh, jump right in. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Signe Olson. My pronouns are they, them, and she, her. And I'm so excited to be here talking to you all today. I am a nurse midwife and nurse practitioner. I am in Washington, D.C., and I'm also a full time faculty at Georgetown <clears throat> University in their nursing program. So I love getting to talk to other universities about the ways that they are promoting gender equity and inclusivity. Um, in their programs and do a lot of inner, um, interdisciplinary collaboration. So I'm thrilled to be here talking to you. Please feel free to ask questions. I know all of you submitted such lovely questions that we're going to talk about today. Um, but if anything comes up, feel free to put that in the chat. I'm just going to get set up here real quick. All right. So we are talking today about ways that we can promote gender equity and inclusive academic environment practices. So I know you all have talked about this to some degree because I went on your website and we've got some really lovely language that you already have um, in place. So here are the objectives we have for today. Obviously, there's lots of filling in the gaps in between these objectives, but our goal is to kind of talk about language and how we can provide a better experience for students and clinical students and on campus and off of campus, how we can communicate better through um, email and verbal communication and lecture and webcasts and all of that. So never going to talk about this with any university or academic setting, we like to think about why this is important. So when we look at the needs of the LGBTQ community, starting in undergrad all the way through graduate students, there's a few common themes that often come up. And one of those is this idea that we're doing all of this and we're having all of these conversations, but it's really only a small, small part of the work that we do or a small part of the students that we're interacting with, et cetera. And we wanna kind of break down some of those barriers. So we wanna acknowledge first and foremost that everybody who's listening to this, everybody that's in this room has interacted not only with LGBTQ students as a whole, but specifically trans, non-binary or gender non-conforming students. Um, and sometimes, depending on where I'm having this conversation, some people might say, you know, I can't think of someone off the top of my head. And we want to hold space for the fact that there are many people who are not visibly out or publicly out. And so when we're having these conversations, we want to frame that through, um, through that lens, that we are having these conversations, we're making these really big recommendations and, and broad recommendations, not just for one or two students or you know, one or two patients in the clinical setting, but really that the more inclusive we can be on a broad scale, the more comfortable individuals are going to feel to be able to express themselves, to come out, um, to have those conversations, et cetera. Um, 
So in, in our background, we know that LGBTQ students have a lot of differing needs and some of them are the exact identical needs of their non-LGBTQ peers. But we wanna look at access to on-campus healthcare for particularly for our undergrad, um, access to mental health services, counseling services. We wanna think about on-campus safety and safety goes beyond just physical safety. That can be emotional safety, safety to bring forward concerns to institutional administration, um, obviously physical safety, walking around campus, near campus, and how people can go about reporting things like discrimination or bias or microaggressions um, within the institution. Particularly for undergraduate students, um, those who may be just graduating high school, we know that they may have decreased financial access. And we know that familial support is the number one protective factor against many disparities that the LGBTQ community faces. So we see that particularly with high school students and um, undergraduate students, meaning that when folks are just coming out into the world on their own, if they have familial support, that is a protective factor against things like homelessness, higher education, uh, suicide rate, health access, health insurance, um, amongst many others. So we wanna not assume what the needs of these individuals are, but we do know um, from research that there's some, some broad themes that will keep coming back. And Gallup had a, a great poll last year that I included here. <clears throat> when we look at uh, self-identification uh, of Americans and you can see percentage of folks who identify somewhere on the LGBTQ spectrum and um, individuals who do not. Um, so we've got our generations here listed along the side. And you can see for folks who were born before 1946, we were out 1.3%. And Gen Z is all the way up to 15.9. We don't have data yet on how many people below 18 identify as LGBT. Q, but we assume that it's going to be uh, presumably even higher. So going back to that, why this matters question in the beginning, we know that not only are students self-identifying more as LGBTQ, but we also know that students expect this content, they expect a safe, inclusive environment, they expect um, administration to respond accordingly. So that is sort of the foundation by which we have these conversations. I do wanna spend just a minute talking about general health disparities of, of this demographic. Um, you can see all of the things that are listed here on the slide. These are health disparities that certainly could come up in the conversations around um, student health, but it could also come up in the broader sense of how do we support students in their academic pursuits and studies and research um, when we know that they are at risk for these things. And some of these things are easily treatable um, and some of them are not. So when we look at things that decrease, for example, the suicide risk or improve mental health of trans and non-binary students, um, we know that that has much more to do with familial acceptance, with support, community support, chosen family, access to services, um, and some of those broader health equity uh, topics of discussion. We also want to acknowledge that there's very high rates of trauma in these individuals. So not only is that medical trauma, uh, trying to access care, but we know that uh, sexual assault and sexual trauma is incredibly uh, common in this demographic. So about 50% of trans individuals have experienced sexual assault. Again, going back to that conversation about how important student health services are and making sure that that is a safe place for people to come if they need care. And community trauma can certainly refer to on campus um, concerns or broader concerns off of campus, um, but knowing that even when it's off campus, that's still, um, you know, a student that is part of 
the, the educational community. And we definitely want to acknowledge that <clears throat> there is an intersectionality aspect to all of this. And when we look at who is most at risk across the board, it is without a doubt trans women of color. They have the highest um, suicide rate, they have the highest homicide rate and the highest rate of hate crimes committed against them. And so when we have students that we know have not only one marginalized identity, but potentially multiple, we do wanna be extra mindful of what kind of support we can give to those students. And you'll often see when, when people talk about this, this concept of health disparities, uh, it's almost always followed by a slide that says resiliency, um, just like this. And, and I leave this in here because I think it's a really important part of the conversation that when we're talking about all of these potentially really detrimental things that can happen to a person um, or near a person, we also need to acknowledge these really deep wells of resiliency that marginalized communities have. <clears throat> However, whenever we talk about resiliency, a lot of times it gets framed in this idea that, oh, wow, you know, yes, marginalized folks have all of these things going on, but look how resilient they are, how amazing. But if we shift that narrative just a little bit, we we definitely want to hold space and acknowledge that resiliency, but we also want to think about what if that, that community or group of people didn't need to be resilient, right? So where does the need for resiliency come from? And typically that comes from the people who are not in that marginalized group of individuals doing more work outside of that. Um, and so that means that the responsibility of creating that environment whole is, is held by the community outside, um, which is why we're having these awesome conversations. We're thinking about ways to promote and um, improve cultural and communication um, and, and the importance of that community really can't be overstated. All right, so I probably won't spend a ton of time, but I do wanna make sure everyone that's listening is on the same, <clears throat> same page in terms of the, the literal words that we use. So you may have heard me say some of these already in the presentation, but let's take a moment and go through what these mean. Sexual orientation is what I'm gonna start with down here. Most people have, was there a question? No, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, sexual orientation is who an individual is attracted to. So when we think about that LGBTQ, acronym, the sexual orientation oftentimes gets a little bit misconstrued with something called gender identity. So sexual orientation just means, um, you know, generally speaking, who that person is attracted to. Is it women who are attracted to women, non-binary folks, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, attracted to other non-binary folks, gay men, um, people who are bisexual, that sort of thing. And then we've got these two terms, gender identity and gender expression. So gender identity is how a person experiences their gender, which is an internal experience, it has nothing to do with the way that they look outside um, or externally. So this person, any person may experience their gender as being female, male, both, neither, and Typically people would say, I identify as male, I identify as female or man, woman, non-binary. And most people are going to, to identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. So that leads us into this. And sex assigned at birth is all about the person who is doing the assigning. So it's a really intentional way to say this. So that's typically a obstetrician, a midwife, pediatrician, possibly the parents, but usually a medical professional. And that is referring to what reproductive organs that individual appears to have. So generally speaking, we all know the two boxes, male and female. There is a third box, intersex, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and in reality, this may or may not be an accurate assigning. And again, the intentionality is there because it's not about <clears throat> what 
the person identifies at, it's what the medical industry has assigned that person. So the two ways that we say this are typically AFAB or AMAB. And that is assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth. So in the medical world, we often use that as shorthand. It's not perfect. Um, there's definitely some very valid critiques of that, but it's a short way to convey very quickly that this person was born with a penis, this person was born with a vulva. Now, again, there's lots of nuance to that, um, but that's how you may see it written. It's Amy. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, cisgender. Can you say something about that? Can yes, that's on the next slide. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Good. Good call. Um, so AMAB or AFAB gives us quick kind of clinical information. And then gender expression is more about the way in which a person expresses themselves externally. So everybody that's in the room that I can see, everybody that I can see on camera, all of us woke up this morning and we made specific choices, whether or not we thought all that much about them, but we made specific choices about how to get dressed, what clothes we were gonna wear, were we gonna put on makeup, were we gonna put on jewelry, were we gonna do our hair a certain way, et cetera. And some of us may not have given any thought to that and other people may give a lot of intentional thought to that. And we all do that typically to express what we have as internal gender identity. So again, internal gender identity, nobody else can see, but it's the experience of the person. Gender expression is what we see on the outside. And then the um, word that we were just talking about, cisgender, is statistically speaking, most people who are listening to this, um, cisgender is the opposite of transgender. So it means that the assigned sex at birth is congruent with the way that the person identifies today. So if we have someone in here who says, the person that delivered me said I was a girl, I identify as a woman, that person would be cisgender. So there's that congruency there. And the opposite of cis is trans or beyond, um, which is an adjective. So it's not a noun, sometimes it gets misconstrued as that. And that's an adjective that refers to an individual who has a gender identity, internal, that is different than what they were assigned at birth. So we might say that OBGYN got it wrong um, in sort of a cheeky way. So that person was assigned male at birth, but they identify as female today. So that person would be typically a trans woman. So trans woman, emphasis on the woman, is typically someone who was assigned male at birth and now identifies as female. A trans man is someone who is assigned female at birth, now identifies as a man. And so that if you ever hear trans woman or trans man, you can always, and you're having that moment of like, ah, which way is it going? The word that's in there is how they identify today. So we don't really worry about what they were assigned at birth. Any questions on that? Nope. Awesome. Um, and just a quick note, sometimes when people are learning language, they will hear words like transgendered, um, which we wouldn't say, we just use it um, as, as an adjective. Um, it's not a verb and it's not a noun, so we wouldn't say a transgender. And we stay away from the term transsexual. If you're reading research on this community, specifically research conducted in uh, Europe, we sometimes will still see the term transsexual. I definitely see patients who still use that word to self-identify. It's usually used in older trans women populations because when folks first came out, this was um, a word that was used very frequently and therefore it's sort of a historical term, but not one that we would use unless we were reflecting language back to somebody. And you've heard me say the term non-binary, so let's define that. So that is an identity where the person really doesn't identify as fully male, fully female. Um, and if we think about gender as a binary, so you've, some of you may have heard the term gender binary before, essentially saying there are two options, male, female. Non-binary sort of gets rid of that and says, I don't identify all the way over here. 
or over here, possibly someone may say they are gender fluid, meaning that sometimes they have more feminine characteristics, sometimes they have more masculine that might be independent from their gender um, expression. So again, the outside gender has nothing to do with how that person necessarily feels internally. Most people will show to the world some representation of their gender, um, but we outside that person um, can't really make any assumptions about that. And then just a few medical terms that um, sometimes come up in conversation, particularly for clinical students, um, possibly if students were taking care of patients um, who were trans or non-binary, you'll hear a lot of talk about surgical procedures. And it's important to know there's no such thing as the surgery. Um, a lot of times people who are well-meaning might say something like, have you had the surgery yet? Um, which is usually kind of an invasive question unless that person is very close. And the short answer is that the surgical options are usually categorized into two categories, top surgery and bottom surgery, which I know feels a little simplistic, but that's generally how they're referred to. And even within top surgery or bottom surgery, those can be made up of multiple different types of surgeries. So um, there's no such thing as the bottom surgery or the top surgery either, um, more so just that it refers to what part of the body that person had surgery on. Can I ask another question of Amy? Um, yeah, always. Can you say something about gender non-conforming, that terminology? It's, I see it used a lot, but then it seems to be being used less. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. And it's a term that essentially says, you know, I'm, I'm not conforming to men or women uh, categorically. Um, but a lot of people I've heard are sort of shifting away from it because it has a negative aspect to it, which I'm not sure how that's all that different from non-binary. They're both starting with non. Um, I think the thought with gender non-conforming is this idea that you are rebellious or you are going against what you're supposed to be doing. Um, you're not conforming, you're not doing what you're supposed to. Um, that's a little bit of the conversation I've heard, but I definitely know a lot of people um, who do still use it uh, academically and personally. So it could come up in conversation, um, but I agree. I think I'm, I'm seeing it sort of slowly being shifted away from. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I assume that most people listening to this have probably heard all the words on this slide, but um, a couple of quick notes. So when we think about, you know, the L standing for lesbian, the gay standing, or the G standing for gay, we often think about those in very cis, cis, uh, cis-centric terms, meaning that we assumed that all lesbians, people who identify as lesbian are cis women. So cis women who are attracted to other cis women. So two people with um, you know, assigned female at birth. But the term lesbian can apply to anybody who's a woman. And some women have a penis and some women have a vagina. And so when we think about lesbian, especially from a clinical sense, um, when we were talking to our clinical students about, for example, taking a sexual health history or talking to a patient about their romantic or sexual partners, we can't make the assumption that when people say, I identify as a lesbian, that they also don't have the potential for pregnancy or the potential need for contraception. Um, gay is generally historically has been used to mean men who are attracted to men, but also has been expanded to be a reference to anybody who does not identify as heterosexual. Um, so you may see cis women who say that they're gay, um, not binary individuals who say they're gay. It's sort of got a very, very broad definition now. Bisexuality is, is a piece that I talk a lot about to my clinical students because there's a lot of myths surrounding them in, in particular around sexual health history, um, sexual practices, et cetera. 
um, but bisexuality is not partner dependent. So if there is somebody who is a cis woman currently partnered to a cis woman, but that person identifies as bi, it doesn't make them any less bi while they're partnered to that other woman. Um, they still have attraction to more than one gender. And um, bisexual students and individuals in general have a lot higher health disparities in certain areas. Uh, the thought is that it's related more to not feeling like they have their own community. Um, many people don't necessarily understand bi as its own valid identity. A lot of people think of it as a phase or an experimentation or, you know, well, this person is bi for now until they find the right woman or man, but it is its own valid um, identity. And people who identify as bi oftentimes feel very isolated because they feel like their identity may be erased if they're in a, uh, a relationship that may be very straight appearing from the outside. So if you're out to dinner um, and you see what looks like a man and a woman, the assumption that most people have in their brains is that couple is a straight couple. Um, and so if these individuals are spending a lot of time in straight spaces, they may not feel like their identity is fully um, validated. And in queer spaces or um, gay spaces, they may feel like they are not really included. So this might be an example of a straight appearing couple that goes to a pride event. Um, and everybody looks at them and says, you know, why are you here? This isn't about straight people. This is a time for um, the LGBTQ community. And so it can be very isolating. And we see that experience all the way from, um, you know, children, through college, through adulthood, um, having some trouble connecting with community. And as we talked about community being that really central, um, important aspect of, of groundedness and, and health. Queer is not a bad word. I take just a second to talk about that because um, especially younger communities are using this word more and more and more. And I know when I came out, my mom was like, oh my goodness, you cannot use that word. It's an offensive slur, absolutely not. Um, but sort of reframing that to community choice. So um, we can all think of um, this concept of reclamation. So if the community is using this word, it's not being used in a malicious way. Um, it's more a definition of expansion and fluidity. Um, individuals can certainly identify however they want. Um, so it is not a, a bad word. It's totally okay to say that if you're talking about a population or a demographic or research. And the only time that it's not okay to say that is if it's used as a slur or in a malicious way. Intersex is that third category of biology that we were referencing earlier, meaning that <clears throat> Uh, when a, a healthcare provider uh, decides at birth if this person is male or female, there should always be a third category. So this is not a um, subjective uh, identity. This is a uh, fact-based physical, biological um, finding in, in humans and many other animals that is used to be called ambiguous genitalia. Now we call it intersex, meaning that that person um, may have a different combination of reproductive organs, chromosomes, hormones, et cetera, and doesn't fall neatly into that category of one or the other. And then asexuality is one that doesn't come up as often in conversation necessarily. This is the individual who does not generally feel sexual attraction towards other people. They may still have romantic attraction, so they may still date, they may still get married, um, but they don't have that drive to have sex. Um, and they sometimes do still have sex, consensual sex, um, for a lot of different reasons, but they don't inherently have that drive. Um, and interestingly, we see both intersex and asexuality exist in about 3% of the population. Um, not that they exist together, but independently about 3% each. 
stuff we've been talking a lot about gender constructs. And as we have any conversation about ways to do better, to communicate better um, with any population, it's really important to think about where these ideas of gender come from in our lives and in our experience. So what would it mean if we started to shift these definitions, right? As humans, we generally like to categorize things, right? We like to have things in boxes with labels. We like to understand what those labels mean. We like nice, tidy definitions, at least I know um, I certainly do. And this idea can kind of shake that up and we don't like that ambiguity. So that's why it can be really tough to have these conversations because we like to know this word means this and this is how I do this. Um, but gender is a little bit more uh, nuanced than that. So a, a self-reflective practice that I like to have people consider is think about your expectations of the different genders. So we'll just say there's two in this exercise. So think about those expectations of men in society. How does society expect them to behave, speak, dress? Um, you know, what traits are they supposed to have and why? Where did those come from? And, you know, vice versa with women. Why are women supposed to dress a certain way, behave a certain way, speak a certain way? Where do those narratives originate from? Where do they come from? And certainly a lot of people will say that began in childhood um, in that messaging. And I would argue that it, it generally happens even earlier than that. We're going to talk about that more in the next slide. Um, so when we think about and reflect on these expectations of gender, we can come up with a whole lot of questions about why things are the way they are. Um, and from a personal standpoint, I would encourage you to reflect on where in your life some of that narrative might have come from. So in childhood, for example, is there something that you really wanted to do but weren't allowed to do because of your gender? Um, are there ways in which you were treated differently than peers of the opposite gender? Um, a very benign example that I share during this exercise is I really wanted to play hockey as a child. I grew up in the Midwest um, near Canada and I really wanted to play hockey. Um, but the people in my immediate circle felt that hockey was too masculine of an activity for a young Midwestern girl. And that was something I wasn't allowed to do. So pretty benign, but you get the idea. Um, and that can, those examples can range on the spectrum of very harmful to potentially uh, more benign. Um, so that would be something I'd encourage you to start to see. Those of you who have kids, particularly young kids, um, once you start to see uh, these little ways in which people convey gendered expectations, you kind of start to see it everywhere. And it's, it's pretty, pretty wild. Um, where these ideas come from. And, and certainly I do this work a lot and I still have moments where I, I witness a thought go through my head and I'm like, well, where did that come from? Um, so none of us are, are totally able to, to undo that messaging because it starts so young. Um, but it's really interesting and, and I encourage you to have some curiosity around it. And then you know, back to that idea of gender expression, you know, why, why did we all wake up today and decide to present the way that we do? Um, what does that say about our own gender identity? And, and lastly, are there ways, spoiler alert, yes, there are, um, ways in which societal expectations harm everybody? So if we can start to identify and understand these expectations of certain genders, we can then start to have the conversation about do those expectations harm everybody, not necessarily just that group that they're referring to. Anyone have questions about anything that we talked about so far? By the way, I can't see, we can't see folks on Zoom. So if you do have a question or comment, then just kind of interject and say who you are and, and speak up. But we're good in the room. 
And I've got my chat up. So if, if those of you who have Zoom open want to private message um, and not ask uh, the group, I'm happy to have, have you do that as well. So when we talk about unnecessary gendering and we start to look at these, um, these concepts more broadly, we start to see gender kind of everywhere. And, and certainly I am not, not immune to this. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, right? You see people, you automatically make assumptions about who that person is, what their gender is. And many of us without thinking will say, you know, that man over there, or that woman over there, um, et cetera, without knowing uh, personally the person that we're referring to. In society, we have all of these pre-established roles or scripts, um, particularly in relation to what does it mean to be someone's son, daughter, sister, brother, mom, dad, husband, wife. And all of those words tend to have a specific emotional reaction to them. So if we did a writing exercise where you write down the characteristics of you know, what, what makes a good son, daughter, sister, et cetera, um, they would generally fall in, in these, these societal themes. And I love this quote by um, Kate Bornstein that talks about gender and, and, and how any question that has two answers probably needs to be expanded a bit more. When we talk about when gendering starts to happen, um, as a midwife, I see this a lot. So an example that's really personal to me is the anatomy sano. You know, we see people at 20 weeks and we get so excited um, when we can say, is this a boy or a girl? When in reality, we know that that may or may not be how that person identifies as they become an adult. And, um, you know, gender reveal parties, I think, are a really uh, excellent example of, of how we, we put these gender norms and expectations on, on babies when they're in utero. And then when their genitalia does not end up being what we thought it was going to, or something unexpected happens, we see something like this. Um, this is a clip from a, a gender reveal fail that um, was supposed to have pink or, or blue balloons and instead the person put rainbow balloons in. And you can see this sort of, uh, this theme of why, why, why do we have this continued obsession with gender? Um, why are we so excited to put all of that societal pressure of whatever gender the baby is onto an infant who has no control over this? Um, so I would argue that these conversations start very, very early and inform the ways in which people believe it's right or wrong to be masculine or feminine. All right, so now we're gonna switch more over into conversations in the academic setting and talk about ways that we can be more inclusive for, for the students that you all work with. Um, it sounds a little bit uh, removed potentially, but we want to start with looking at policy statements and and broad institutional statements. So I pulled this from from y'all's website and uh, looks great. Definitely has you've got lots of areas on your website that are dedicated to inclusive research, inclusive teaching practices, and we know that that's where it has to start. So. When mission and values are congruent, we have a foundation on which to stand to uh, be able to have these conversations and make meaningful change. We know that student voice is super, super important. Um, and sometimes those voices need to be heard more. And in some institutions, um, they have lots of avenues to be able to be engaged and have those discussions. So, um, you know, in, that can be in an institutional setting, that can be in broader organizational settings, but having some avenue in which student feedback can clearly make it um, to the individuals who have more power um, is vital if we want to have a student-centered approach to diversity. And then lastly, just 
you know, honoring that this is an ethical commitment and that uh, the stories and narratives of historically oppressed uh, communities very much deserve to be shared. And, you know, we do have to sort of reckon with the idea that academia has not always been a welcoming space, and we get to be the ones in charge of that to shift and shape that um, into a very different type of experience for the learner. So when we look at the kind of different buckets that we want to focus on, these are the four that I kind of kind of focus on. Um, and they might shift and they might be a little bit different year to year, uh, school to school, but I want to look at curriculum, what is actually being taught to the students. We want to look at areas of scholarship, and I know you all are um, you know, very invested in research opportunities. So what do those research opportunities look like for students? We want to look at the day-to-day -day experience of of queer students and what does that look like in terms of their peers? What does that look like in terms of professors and mentorship? And what does that mentorship look like beyond um, when those individuals are alumni or they are, are coming back to collaborate, et cetera? We wanna look at diversity and diversity <clears throat> goes far beyond um, marketing and, and website language, but that goes to faculty members and that goes to the broader student population. How are the recruitment processes for bringing in students who are diverse? Um, what are those uh, recruitment policies for faculty? A conversation that I've definitely had with a couple institutions is a issue with hiring very diverse adjunct faculty, but not very diverse full-time faculty, and what message that conveys um, when we're talking about reparations for, for historically marginalized populations who have been harmed. We know that um, continuing to put people in roles where they don't have full access um, and when they don't have the ability to have a full voice can be harmful and kind of perpetuate the issues we've seen. So when we look at, this is just sort of general students <clears throat> who are either on campus or off of campus. We know that healthcare, all of those health disparities that we mentioned are super important. We wanna make sure that those providers who are providing services in the student health arena have training, understand the language and, and the needs of these communities. If student health does not provide gender affirming hormone care, um, considering offering that, there's a lot of um, universities that are beginning to offer that so that their students can stay on campus and not have to trek to multiple appointments across the city. Um, obviously campus housing, how that works, is there physical safety, who can incidents be reported to, visibility on the website, not only in um, photos, but in language. Anytime we're talking to other faculty members or um, coordinating housing, coordinating classes, community events, et cetera, making sure that we have consent from students to disclose identity. I've worked with students sometimes who um, sort of unintentionally became a poster child or had their identity um, disclosed without quite being ready. Um, signage, posters, anything that's visible. Uh, what clubs, uh, events, community involvement, what is available that supports that student's uh, learning and identity. We talked about diverse faculty, and I'm a big fan of pronoun pins. I know they're small and they are not by any means a, a fix all, but normalizing talking about pronouns and acknowledging uh, variance in pronouns, I think it's important. And then these are um, kind of even more direct ideas. Um, a couple of folks in their comments mentioned that you all had a recently changed uh, gender neutral bathroom, which is fantastic. Um, and trust me, any student that would like to use a gender neutral bathroom will know exactly where those are located. Um, and I'd encourage looking at different buildings on campus, 
um, so that an individual doesn't need to trek too far in order to be able to find a gender neutral uh, bathroom. Talking to different offices, making sure there's training on a broad level, but I really am a fan of small group training after large group discussions because lots of people find that there are a lot of people who don't feel comfortable talking about these things and fear that they're going to be shamed or judged for asking a question that is very legitimate but they just don't know the answer to. Um, so making sure that individual offices, etc., cetera, um, may have access to their own uh, continued discussions and oftentimes that's one-on-one, -on -one. making sure forms have inclusive language and that's a, a big undertaking depending on the place. Um, but when I was looking on, on your website, it looked like there was already really excellent um, inclusive language. Fiscal environments, um, wherever somebody is, they're going to notice their environment and there's going to be small messaging <clears throat> conveyed through that. Um, normalizing your own pronouns. It's a super easy two second thing to do in your email signature. You just put your name, pronouns, colon, and what you use. Um, some people will, you know, copy and paste like a small image or something that is uh, rainbow or expresses the fact that they're an ally or this is a safe space. Really recommend doing the sh uh, secret shopper experience if you are able to essentially having a person who uh, poses as a potential student who wants to come apply um, or take a class and just sort of uh, observes, you know, what was it like if I was a student sort of start to finish in that process, where are ways, and it's not through a punitive lens by any means, but where are ways that we can improve. We had a question in the chat here, at what age do we recommend children be asked what pronouns they prefer? Awesome question. It changes, I would say it's very child dependent as, as uh, many of those conversations are. Most children will have a sense of what their gender is by about age three. And it's not always necessarily about asking as much as it is exposing children to a variety of pronouns. So telling, you know, reading a storybook where the main character has various, you know, uh, pronouns, having family members or friends talk about that openly usually leads to the child saying something like, um, you know, I think that I want to go by she now. Um, and just sort of affirming that experience. And children's gender can absolutely shift throughout their life. Um, but we know that age three is usually when they start to have a more grounded concept of what gender is. Um, so if you do ask them at age three, um, they are likely to be able to verbalize and, and answer to you, but it may or may not stay the same. So we're looking in the actual classroom setting Many of those same things apply that we just talked about, but we have a few more detailed things here. So setting the tone early, that means your syllabus, that means any post that's on the wall, your email signature, uh, students are going to notice these things and, and whether or not it's conscious or not, they're going to start to um, make assumptions uh, about inclusive practices. Obviously knowing institutional policies, what's available, um, what community groups or on campus groups exist, avoiding assumptions. So I don't think this happens super often in, in the beginning, but you know, if you are having a conversation with a student that talks about you know, their personal life outside of the academic setting, we wanna make sure that we know that person's pronouns know how they want to be referred to um, and if somehow their gender or sexuality came up in conversation we don't want to make assumptions. Um, same thing goes obviously avoiding invasive questions and, and that doesn't typically come up in the average conversation. This could come up again in the clinical um, component setting where you, know, you might be teaching students how to interact respectfully with patients and pretty much everything that we talk about today applies just through the lens of patient care, uh, email communication, um, 
really looking at what assignments and readings exist in the course. So maybe that is an assignment about the topic at hand, but through a lens of health equity and asking them to um, con consider, you know, if they're doing a conversation on dermatology, how does that discussion change if we are referring to the LGBTQ community. Um, in one of the courses I teach, we do that for every section in primary care. So they have to choose a demographic um, that might have an aspect of health equity that we need to pay better attention to. So for example, in dermatology, they may choose racial disparities in dermatology. In um, urology, they may talk about uh, post-op trans individuals and disparities in the way that people access them. Um, again, normalizing pronouns and asking students how they would prefer to have those interactions look. So that might be teaching in a classroom where another student misgenders a student. Um, now, sometimes in the moment, you just do the best that you can and you may correct that person. You may not call out the person who did the misgendering. Maybe after class, you ask the student that was misgendered, hey, I noticed so-and-so used the wrong pronoun for you. Um, in the future, would it be helpful for you if I was the one that corrected them instead of you having to do that emotional labor? And some people will say, yes, please. Um, that would be great. <laughs> I don't wanna do that. Other people might say, I really don't wanna call any more attention to it. Um, and either way, it's usually appreciated that there is that extra layer of communication. And then when we're looking again in the curriculum, just taking this a little bit further, um, if you're updating your syllabus before next term um, or you are revamping a whole course, consider what the course titles are. So um, in a program that I teach in, we recently took um, the word woman out. So it doesn't say women's health care. It says gynecological care, which is more specific. Um, so updating course language itself, updating objectives, readings, making sure that we include experts in the field um, so that all of the voices that exist in our syllabus and in our assigned readings, making sure that they don't all have the same demographic. Um, same thing goes for webcasts. Who are we asking to record webcasts? Um, are they experts in the field? Are they internal? Um, obviously, budgets are always a really tricky thing to navigate, but when able to advocate for budget items that is, is paying a faculty member, is paying a member of a marginalized community, especially to talk about their experience, it is becoming much more standard. Um, to not expect any type of diverse conversation from a marginalized individual uh, be unpaid. So that's becoming more standard, uh, regardless of, of what curriculum content you're talking about, and making sure that existing webcasts, as much as you're able to um, you know, update those or replace those, and when you're not able to, sometimes I'll make a little note that just says um, you know, the value of this particular webcast is so important. Um, please note that this person does not use X, Y, and Z, or, uh, you know, please note this. Um, in class discussions, again, making sure that the case studies you use are diverse. The exam questions that you use are diverse and inclusive. And that can be as easy as saying, you know, your case study revolves around a 42 year old woman, you can add in 42 year old cis woman or cisgender woman. Um, and that helps to normalize those conversations. In the clinical setting, somebody asked a really good question about LGBTQ clinical students. And many of the same aspects apply. I think I would go a little bit beyond and say proactive discussions before starting clinical can be really helpful. Most people who are undergraduates or adults have some semblance that they are going to be misgendered if they're going into healthcare. And that can just be something you need to hold space for. Um, again, obtaining consent from a student. If you have the ability for them to have their chosen name on their name badge, um, 
for a lanyard or pronoun pins, et cetera, that can be really helpful, making sure they have either mental health support or a mentor in the field that is either culturally congruent or an ally to debrief with. Sometimes it can be really exhausting if you're talking about clinical students getting misgendered all day long, um, needing a place to sort of vent and talk about that um, or debrief. And mentorships from faculty, certainly, and maybe that student wants um, something that is not listed on this and simply just asking can, can give us some better ideas. When we're talking about students who are not necessarily in the LGBT community wanting to normalize these conversations in the clinical setting, this um, can go a lot of different ways. So I'm gonna be totally realistic that you're not gonna see this at every single patient interaction. Um, but if I'm the student, just simply saying, hi there, my name is Sydney, and I'm going to be your student nurse working with you today. My pronouns are she, her, or they, them. I see the name on your chart is Michelle. Is that the name that you go by, or do you have another name that you'd like me to use? Michelle works great. Obviously, our patient is very, very enthusiastic today. The student saying, awesome, and what pronouns would you like for me to use? Michelle says, you can use she, her. I say, great, I'm looking forward to working with you today. That is a ideal conversation. Um, when I was polling a couple of my nursing student friends, they, they guesstimated to me that about one in four to one in three patients would respond like this. So that may or may not be um, the response that that student gets. And that can be influenced by a client who is hard of hearing, who does not know any of this language, who says, you know, I don't know what the kids are doing these days, but I don't understand any of that. Um, so it, it is evolving. It's realistic. Um, you know, I don't think any of us live in this world where we assume all of our interactions are going to be textbook, but normalizing these conversations, normalizing pronouns, what would you like me to call you? Um, even just what would you like me to call you can be a huge sense of relief for people who don't go by their legal first name. Um, evaluating student experience. This is mostly about surveys um, or that um, secret shopper experience, but what is it like to be a student and how do we figure out what it's like to be a student if we're not students? Because um, it, it can be really hard for students to, to feel comfortable acknowledging things that aren't great um, for fear of retaliation. And a couple people, um, unsurprisingly, asked about how do I not offend people, particularly when using language. So um, this is sort of the theme we'll end on. <clears throat> when you're having conversations, really like grounding yourself, understanding that you are a imperfect human because we all are. And when you take feedback, do it as much with grace as you're, you're able to. I'm certainly a perfectionist in recovery. I don't like to be wrong either, um, but accepting that we will be wrong. Um, if you are a cisgender person, sort of inherently acknowledging that that power dynamic exists and the tone and language in which we discuss this um, concept matters. And if someone has disgust in their voice or they roll their eyes or they uh, harumph under their breath or any of those things that in and of itself, regardless of what the person says, is going to be conveyed. So there we're going to talk about a couple things that we can do um, in the moment in just a second. But um, many folks think that they are very inclusive and yet the LGBT community may not see that. Um, and that can be really hard when we're trying really deeply to do the right thing, say the right thing, and we're still messing up um, and just acknowledging that uh, verbally and broadly. Um, you know, I'm an imperfect person, I'm going to mess up. Please know that is not my intention and I am more than happy to stand corrected um, and do better. This is what we're doing currently. And just you know, going back to that um, concept we said earlier about repeating frequently and supporting staff for whom this is super new. Um, it takes practice. None of us um, who teach this material learns this overnight. This is 
you know, a long time in the making. Um, but we do know that interaction, interpersonal interactions and language um, tend to be the single most um, important thing, which is great because it's free. Um, this kind of goes back to what we were discussing above. So I don't think we need to talk too much about this, but again, just avoiding stereotyping that you might see in academic or clinical setting. These are some lists of things that may unintentionally uh, be said. And I want to point out um, this third one from the bottom here is one that I see not infrequently. Uh, when people learn a person is trans or non-binary, they might say, I would never have known you used to be a girl or a boy. Um, and that can be really invalidating because that person probably feels as if they never were a girl or a boy. Um, and some of these are just common sense and, and respectful communication. And we want to avoid things like real man, real woman. And, you know, we talked a little bit like um, of this bullet point here, but it is not new. None of these identities are new. They've existed for as long as humans have existed. And just because we are seeing it more now in the media makes people think that it is increasing, um, but it is more about the, the broader population having better language to self-identify now. So on the tone of language, these are some options. So you've heard me say some of these in our discussion today. Um, you've probably heard me say folks or y'all or everyone. Um, definitely, I know a lot of my, my colleagues in academia have a tough time with folks or y'all because it feels so informal. Um, and I would encourage you to just reframe it a little bit that it does sound those things sometimes, but we can make it more formal and we can do it through a lens of gender equity or inclusion. Um, we want to avoid things like preferred pronoun or name and just say, this is so-and-so's pronouns, this is so-and-so's name. We could say chosen name. Um, and some of these are only applicable when you are discussing somebody that you don't know. So this is not saying that we should not use the terms he or she or mom or dad or husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, etc. This is only saying when we're talking about the broader population or someone across the room or someone that we've never spoken to that when we use more gender neutral language, it is better for everybody. So obviously if we know who we're speaking to or we know the patient that we're speaking to um, uses she, her pronouns, then it's appropriate to say woman or she, et cetera. So this is only referring to um, when we're interacting with other folks. Um, and then a quick note on clinical setting language. The terms sperm producing individual or person who produces sperm, person with a uterus and ovaries, et cetera, that's really only um, appropriate clinical language when you are referring to a sexual health history taking. So if you had clinical nursing students that you're teaching to have some inclusive information or uh, discussions with, really we're only asking about this because medically or clinically we want to know is that person at risk for pregnancy or do I need to talk about contraception etc. Um, we certainly don't want to reduce someone to um, their body parts um, but sometimes when we're taking a sexual health history it can be um, better to do that. And then lastly, um, this is the model that I teach that's called spin engineer teeth which is uh, created by um, a human named Jay Smooth, which asks the person to consider that if someone points out a behavior of yours, whether it is transphobic or racist or just not respectful, you can think of it as someone just pointing out spinach in your teeth. So instead of having that defensive, angry reaction that so many people do, um, thank that person for their input. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I had never thought of that. Go check in the mirror, remove the spinach, and go about your day. It doesn't have to result in someone feeling ashamed or angry or defensive. Um, it's simply the removal and um, doing better going forward. So I like that framing of it um, because so many people when we have these conversations get 
um, very anxious about the way that they are potentially going to offend someone. So I'm going to end on that. Um, contact information is here if folks have additional questions about references. And thank you. Sorry, I'm a few minutes over. Thank you all for having me. It was so lovely. We do have time for questions. Are you okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. And we have a we have the chat open. So if anyone on Zoom has a question in the chat, go ahead and throw it in. So Amy, of course I have a question. Yes. Or actually, it's a comment. Um, I am Sydney. Just so you know who you're talking. Um, I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner who works in a level four surgical NICU for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that you bring up the idea of, um, and of course I'm older, ambiguous genitalia, and that it does happen and that it, you know, that it does exist, that not every baby born can be identified male or female immediately. Um, now, granted, it's a very small portion of the population, but it does happen. And I'm so glad to hear you include that in your presentation. So, because I think there are a lot of people who, who don't, don't understand that sometimes the crib card is pink and sometimes it's blue and sometimes it's white, you know? Um, Absolutely. And, and that the resolution of those issues because socially we have to declare a gender. Um, the resolution is a complex process and it's different for every baby. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely, I could. we could have a whole different discussion on the ethics of intersex and the decisions that are sometimes made for people without their consent and um, all of the pieces that go into that. And, and sometimes we see ambiguous genitalia physically, like what's external to the, the baby's body. Um, but when we're looking at the broader definition, there's lots of people who don't learn that they're intersex until they come to see me for fertility treatment. And their external genitalia perhaps did not give that away. But when we do a karyotype chromosomal analysis, then for the first time in their life at age 35, they discover that. So um, it's far more common than people think. It's a lot more common. And it's not always just a matter of genetics mm -hmm. because there's, you know, as most of us as clinicians know, there's genotype and phenotype, and there are so many different variations of it. Yeah. We could get into some great case studies, but <laughs> oh yeah, not today. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I have a comment in the chat, seeing children and adolescents for psychiatry. Yeah, absolutely. Totally appropriate. Um, and a nickname is also a really good um, way to sort of signal because it, especially if it's, you know, in front of parents or in front of someone where you don't necessarily know if that person would be supportive um, and saying, you know, like, what is your nickname is a great way to say, is there a name that you prefer I call you? Absolutely. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I mean, I feel like my head is like so full of so many ideas and I think about this stuff a lot <laughs> and you oh, yeah. still have introduced many, many new ideas. I, and it's constantly something I'm thinking about in my social life when I interact with my friends and talking about their kids. And, um, and I, try to, I try to be sort of educational um, across all spectrums of my social networks, but it's a challenge sometimes because I have a lot of friends right now that are like, well, you know, these kids are just exploring. They don't really know what they're, what they're all about. And they're going to like settle on, you know, boy, girl, or, you know, straight, gay along the way. And I try to expand their ideas about the spectrum of experiences and identities. And so it's always, it's always a challenge. Absolutely. One of the, the largest research studies on sexuality, um, I believe said that over, you might actually know this, closer than I do, um, I think it was over 20 or 30 years, 
um, people's sexuality and how what words they use to identify changes something like 80% of the time um, in that one cohort. And meaning that some people at some parts of their life felt one way. Now there could be a little bit of bias, obviously, um, in who was being pulled there, but um, yeah. And children is, is, I think, such a heated topic in, in the, the area of gender inclusivity because absolutely children do change their minds. Um, and also we know that by age 18, if a child does identify as um, either transgender or non-binary, they have um, less than 1% chance that they will go on to identify as something other than that in the future. And that research also speaks to people moving from identifying as, for example, a trans man to non-binary. So it's probably very low. Um, I had a great comment in the chat here. I so appreciate you bringing that up. Yes, it can be very insensitive, refer to that person. These are really specific clinical times. So if you had someone that you were, um, uh, let me read the whole, whole comment. The, wouldn't it be insensitive to refer to a woman as a person with a uterus if that person has had a hysterectomy? Absolutely. Um, so when this sometimes comes up, we see it can be appropriate when we're talking about things like fertility and sexual health. Um, more so when you already know a little bit about that person's um, background. And the time that I use it the most is when I am doing patient education. So if I'm talking about fertility options that involve two people with a uterus, for example, is when I might use that phrase. Um, and you're absolutely right. We wouldn't want to use that to refer to all women because many people have had hysterectomies. Um, many people don't have ovaries. Many people have one but not the other. And we can't make assumptions about that um, on someone's age or gender, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it's a very, very niche uh, time that it would be uh, appropriate to use. Uh, Amanda. Somebody here? Uh, someone has their hand raised on Zoom. Hi. Oh, hi there. Hi. So I'm not at UB. I'm a, I graduated from UB a few years ago. I am the director of an education department for a home care company, mm -hmm. um, local in Buffalo. Um, and I would say it's a less progressive environment, maybe not for lack of willingness, just that it, it in general, it's a less progressive field. It's more old school, including like who works for us, but just regulations in general are less progressive. And like I said, not for a lack of willingness, I don't think. And so what suggestions do you have for an environment that's maybe less ripe for accepting this sort of information and implementing it? Yeah. Are you thinking that it's, it's, it's accepted by the people that work there, but just not well implemented? I, I don't think it, it I, I bet it would be. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I, I always recommend starting with conversations and, you know, like a needs assessment. So there are some areas where it might not be as um, forefront, like it might not be priority. Um, and that's okay. All fields, you know, work a little bit differently. But starting with conversations about, you know, do we take care of clients who are LGBTQ? And if so, what feedback have we gotten from them? Is it that we're rock stars and they don't have any issues with what we're doing? Awesome. Um, or is it that their care provider <clears throat> is misgendering them or wanting to, you know, ascribe certain gender characteristics to them, et cetera? Um, so sort of figuring out what the, the needs or, or issues of the community are. And then conversations, I really think all conversations um, around inclusivity really should stem from that foundation of gender that we talked about, sort of like breaking down those gender bias, gender norms, um, why are they harmful? It's not just about the LGBTQ community. So when we teach this and we're, we're explaining to people who are cisgender, who are not part of the LGBTQ community, they <clears throat> oftentimes respond better when we are connecting it back to why is this relevant to them. Um, so it's not that othering of, you know, this community is so high needs and high maintenance that I have to go out of my way in order to do X, Y, and Z. Um, it's more about 
these are things that are good for everybody. Um, and this is the way in which, you know, gender norms have potentially harmed you personally or harmed our community, society, whatever. Um, and then, you know, really easy ways are pronouns like in the signature um, and forms. I think forms are one of the easiest actionable things that you can do to say, um, you know, even just adding like, you know, sex assigned at birth, male, female, intersex, you know, nickname, chosen name, name you wish to go by on the form can help designate um, very easily that you are a human or an organization that is safe to have those conversations at, um, and then kind of working your way up. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, comment in the chat, can you talk about dead naming? Yes, absolutely. So the term dead naming is one that refers to people who are using <clears throat> the name of typically a person who is trans or non-binary or uses a totally different name in their day-to-day -day life and people using their old name or their former name or birth name. And the term dead naming is can be used by anybody, but is, is often used by people in the trans community in the sense of that person no longer exists. I am this person now um, and is really harmful. I see this a lot with, um, when I work with, with trans teenagers, um, I see this a lot with parents. So whoever made the comment, I think, Nicole, you were talking about working with, with kids and adolescents. Um, it can be a really awkward conversation to be in the room with a child or a teenager and a parent, and the parent is using one name, the child has asked you to call them another name, and it's this kind of weird power dynamic back and forth. Um, so that could be a time where you encounter this. Um, we definitely see this in health records and academic records where, um, the institution says we cannot use another name. It has to be your current legal name. Um, some of you may have seen this if there's students who change their legal name in school. Um, I've worked with a number of <clears throat> teenagers who, whose parents will not allow them to change their legal name or um, documentation when they're like 17, 18, going to college because they fear that their college application is going to be lost or they fear um, there will be some mix up where they're not able to get financial aid, the documents don't line up, et cetera. Um, so if you know, places have a policy in place, yeah, insurance issues are super problematic. And sometimes that necessitates the clinician on the phone saying, I sent a pap smear for this person. This person has a cervix. I know you're telling me that they don't need a pap smear, but I assure you um, I did a pap smear on this person and just sort of advocating. Um, I've had folks who have transitioned to uh, have male documentation um, need fertility treatment. And I've had a few people who have actually changed their documentation back to its original form in order to access thousands of dollars of fertility treatment after they're pregnant um, or after they've given birth, then move their documentation back and forth. So all of that is a lot of emotional labor uh, for that individual to go to. So long story short, dead naming, never appropriate, um, is something that is sometimes accidental or in, unintentional. Um, so that could be like calling someone from the waiting room or on a, a roster, not knowing. Uh, that they go by a different name. It can be very painful for trans or non-binary people to hear if they're assuming somebody is going to use their chosen name. So if there are forms that have a chosen name field, making sure that that gets to where it needs to be um, so that the clinician is not assuming um, otherwise. Good questions. I have a quick question, yep. maybe not a quick answer. What do you think about in terms of cancer prevention? So we're seeing that in all age groups, right? So if you think of testicular cancer, ovarian, uterine, prostate, and how do we approach the individual in a clinical situation so that we can, they may be a trans woman, trans man, 
and how do we approach this so that we get the right screening done? Love that question. Yeah, reproductive cancers are higher amongst all uh, trans men um, who have not had any surgery. Trans women, there's a little bit of a question of whether or not estrogen therapy reduces prostate cancer risk potentially, um, but definitely in trans men, we see these disparities <clears throat> pretty significantly. And the biggest reason that people cite is that trans men are not feeling comfortable when they go to see their primary care or GYN provider. And that goes back to trauma-informed training for clinicians and gender-inclusive training for specifically people who do pelvic exams and pelvic care. Um, so I do a lot of that training with students, clinical students I work with of what language do we use? How do you ask for consent? What body parts do you, or what language do you use to refer to body parts? Um, lots of different layers in that. Could talk about that for a long time. Um, in terms of more broad, um, most people who are on testosterone and have a cervix know that they need a pap smear, but there are some people out there who do not know that if they're on testosterone and they still have a cervix that they need a pap smear. So reducing um, or improving knowledge about one's own body and sort of what that plan looks like. I still think that the number one thing I see in, in clinical practice is folks coming in and saying, I've never had a pap smear. I haven't had a pap smear in 10, 15 years because my last discussion with a provider was so traumatic. Um, and then in terms of things like mammogram screening, that's another one where it comes up pretty often. It is super tricky because I'm not usually the one doing the mammogram, obviously. And then I have to help prepare that uh, patient to go to a different facility. I don't have control over who the tech is, et cetera. And that can be really triggering for people. Um, we don't have great research yet. So another uh, harm reduction strategy is research institutions. So I can think of, you know, 50 different amazing PhDs or um, DNPs for students that revolve around these topics. And, um, you know, one of them is, should we be doing mammograms for, for trans women? Um, what do those healthcare risks actually look like? Um, are they higher than cis men, but lower than cis women? When should we start to do them, et cetera? Um, and should we be doing any type of ultrasound chest screen in place of a mammogram for people who have had bilateral double mastectomies for gender affirmation. And that procedure is different than bilateral double mastectomies for people who have had a history of breast cancer. And so we can't necessarily compare those two groups easily. Um, a particular research interest I have that I've not seen really go too far is that some research suggests a correlation between uh, transgender or non-binary identity of AFAB individuals who haven't had surgery, so folks with the uterus and, and ovaries, and whether or not they have diagnosed or undiagnosed PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which we know increases rates of endometrial cancer. So if that individual has undiagnosed <clears throat> PCOS, and is on testosterone, in theory, their, their risk shouldn't be all that different than if they were on uh, combined hormonal birth control pills, but um, we don't have any research on it. Um, so if we have a potential correlation between PCOS and non-cisgender gender identity, um, is there something more to explore there? So um, I don't know, that was a very long-winded answer to your question, but we have a lot of work to do in reproductive cancers. Thank you. I have maybe one final question, it's 125. Um, what advice do you have for folks to be good allies, advocates, particularly in um, environments where it's maybe not gonna be received very well? So, you know, in a, in a clinical situation where there are, you know, other people on the team that are not, not affirming, how do you intervene diplomatically, effectively, and all that? Yeah, are you thinking also in like the clinical setting with like preceptors or people that they're working with? 
And yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, this could apply in many different situations, you know, in terms of like maybe even an environment or a university environment where maybe there are people that are receptive as receptive or in your own social circles where people aren't thinking. Yeah, I think a, a big one that we we mentioned briefly is asking consent for the person that you want to advocate for. Um, I know I've definitely had times in my life where I got on my you know advocacy high horse, thinking that I was doing good and uh, you know defending someone when they had the wrong pronouns used or the wrong name used, or I thought there was discrimination going on. Um, and then later came to find out that that person would have much preferred I just kept my mouth shut. Um, so I think knowing what the preference of the person that we're trying to help um, is, and that can be proactive conversations. Um, you know, you may or may not have those in a general classroom setting, but if you um, see something happen, you haven't had that conversation, you don't know how that person wants to have you respond, I think do the best that you can in that moment and generally speaking not make a big deal out of it but just say hey uh she or he or model um you know if we're talking about pronouns model what should be used and if um you have an opportunity to debrief with the person afterwards just saying i didn't know if you wanted me to say something or not say something i didn't want to make it a big deal and put you on the spot but in the future you know how can I best support you? Um, I think that's really helpful advice that my younger self would definitely give. Um, and I think anything that you can do to be open in your mind, I think a lot of us, um, you know, our embodied advocacy kind of does this. And we really want to be the person to help and to to do the right thing and being really open to feedback, um, I think is, is my second most important aspect because we, I'm thinking of the very first time I did a, a pap smear on a trans guy. Um, I like had all my ducks in a row and I knew what language I was gonna say and <clears throat> I said something awkward anyways. And afterwards I had an opportunity to say to the patient, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just curious, was there anything I could have done in that clinical scenario to better support you or make this a more comfortable? Um, and he said to me, actually, that was like the best pap smear I've ever had, but you said the word vagina. And that really threw me for a loop because I don't reference my body that way. And in the moment, of course, my brain was like, ah, I knew that, why did I say that thing? Um, but what I said to the patient was, thank you so much for sharing that. So I think that openness and that willingness to be wrong, um, which none of us like to be, and definitely our nervous systems can have that sort of heightened response. But most people in the LGBT community are really forgiving and understanding if we quickly recognize it, make note of it, and continue on what they the research is pretty clear that what they don't want to happen is oh my gosh i just went to that training with signy i can't believe i said that and they make it into this really big apology um this really big thing and many conversations with people in my life and through research says that that is what we want to avoid so i think the way to be the best ally is do the work yourself outside of those interactions, kind of like if we're talking to parents, um, I often say, you know, there's a lot to process here. There can be grief and excitement and sadness, um, but it's your job to do that work outside of those conversations with your child, um, kind of in a similar manner for different power dynamics. Um, you know, as a white person, I need to do my work um, to to be anti-racist, but I need to do that on my own. As a cisgender person, um, you know, I would say folks should be doing that work on their own and utilizing resources when appropriate, but not, um, not having the expectation that the marginalized community is going to necessarily be the one filling in all the gaps and doing all of the explaining. Um, so I think asking consent and, and, and openness and willingness um, accepting that we'll be wrong sometimes. Those are the two big themes. That's a fantastic way to tie up our presentation for today. Unless someone else had anything else, anybody, no? I wanna thank you so much. So informative and so much to think about. And um, you know, I encourage everyone to contact Signe directly if you have any 
follow-up questions that you feel more comfortable asking one-on-one, -on -one, but absolutely. We, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It's so good to see everyone. Um, please feel free to reach out if you need anything at all um, and have a lovely weekend. Happy Friday. Thank <laughs> you.